when it happens the second time and the third time, you begin to wonder whether or not it's really an accident. It was back in the 60s and 70s and people just were in and out of relationships all the time. And I've told myself, you sitting here next to a cold-blooded chuck. Most people who's convicted say, I didn't do it, I'm innocent. Yeah, well, okay. Just to think of all the happiness and joy she could have brought all of us and, and all the people, the new people that would have come into her life. The 1962 death of Mary Horton Vail was initially ruled an accidental drowning. While investigators weren't convinced, there wasn't much they could do at the time. After all, there were no witnesses, and the man at the center of the investigation was never brought before a grand jury. So the case just seemed to disappear along with much of the evidence. But in 2013, one of the oldest code cases in U.S. history would reemerge, along with a broader picture of the life and loves of Felix Bell. And where was the last time you saw Sharon? In Key West, Florida. We had been living in in uh, Miami for a while, uh, managing a health food restaurant and and growing alfalfa sprouts and selling them to uh, health food stores. And and. Uh, doing a little movie work. Still, Felix says things were not good for his girlfriend, Sharon Hensley. Her mother had sent her to San Francisco to uh, get rid of an unwanted pregnancy. So I don't know how long before I met Sharon that that had happened, but uh, Sharon was having a lot of emotional um, distress about having to give up her child. Felix says the free-spirited model wanted to escape her past and her family. The plan was the witness protection plan, that, that you know, WITPRO they call it for short, uh, where you, if <laughs> you just disappear, you get another name and you disappear yourself from all of your acquaintances. Some, some other place to live, another state, another country, whatever, whatever it takes. And Felix says Sharon had the means to make the plan work. She had access to money anytime she needed it, modeling or whatever, so I wasn't worried about her. I mean, you know, being able to manage herself. Felix says he moved on, continuing to add to a growing list of women to enter his life and the life of his son, Bill. He was married at least seven times that I know of. Including Annette Craver. I met Annette in Houston, Texas. 15-year-old Annette quickly caught the eye of 41-year-old Felix. The two would marry when Annette was just 17, and Felix would introduce his new bride to Bill and his wife, Janet. Bill and I had just married, <laughs> and so here we are in our 20s. He's married to a girl that's younger than me. Watching her, it was so evident that she wanted to please Felix. Looking how to please him was her all of her whole focus. It was hard to see in such a beautiful girl. A beautiful girl with more than just companionship to offer. The couple was living off of a large inheritance Annette received after the death of her father. In addition to the money, there was also a family home Annette shared with her mother. Together with the executor, we got the house put in Annette's name and, and, and since there was money available, Annette gave her money or, or paid the debt off and gave her, money, her mother 10000 or so, I think, and, and, and told her to leave go live someplace else. Soon, Annette would sign the home over to Felix, and within months, she too had disappeared. Once again, Felix Bell, the last known person to see her alive. The last time I saw her, she left with some people from Canada who were going south 
Felix says the only real coincidence of the two women's disappearances was that they shared a common goal. They wanted to go off the grid with their mothers. That was all. They didn't care about anybody else. They just wanted to get away from their mothers. Once again, Bill would be questioned about his father, this time by Tulsa police looking into Annette's disappearance. They asked, did I believe that he may have murdered her? And, and I said yes. While there wasn't enough evidence to make an arrest, suspicion continued to drive the headlines. Everyone, it seemed, wanted to talk to the man who on more than one occasion had accused his own father of murder. Matter of fact, I came to a point where lots of times when they would call, I would, I would talk to him and I wouldn't even give the phone to Bill because it was so hard for him. Bill was dealing with struggles of his own. He had always talked about wanting to meet his mom and how he wished he could have grown up with her. Depression and post-traumatic stress pushing Felix and Mary's son to the brink of suicide. I did not want to live. I mean, I, you know, my, I had been ready to go to heaven ever since I was a child. Then he was diagnosed with stage four esophageal cancer. Ironically, I'm probably one of the few people who, who had to contain my joy when, when I was diagnosed with that. Um, it was like, yes, I got my ticket to heaven and it's not of my doing. The last time I spoke to him, he was really in failing health. And he said, you know what, at least now I'll get to meet mama. Bill Vale passed away in 2009 at the age of 46. While it would have been easy for the investigation into Felix to die with him, Annette's mother, Mary Rose, was not about to give up. She called me out of the blue and, and just said, um, would you be interested in writing about a serial killer living in Mississippi? And I'm like, well, yeah, sure. In 2012, she would enlist the help of investigative reporter Jerry Mitchell out of Mississippi. And so we continue these conversations, and at some point she says, well, I'm going to go down and confront him. And I'm like, well, I want to go with you. That's when Mary Rose led Mitchell to the home of Felix Vale. All of a sudden she finds something, and she throws it out, and it clanks on the floor. It's a machete. And then she finds another machete, and then another machete, and then all these swords, she's throwing all this on the floor in front of me, and I'm going, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> You're was, standing on this man's property at this point. Yeah, I am. I, I didn't know if he was there or not or where he was. And They never encountered Felix on that trip, but what Mitchell did get was a copy of Mary Horton Vell's autopsy. It was included in a mound of paperwork Mary Rose had collected during her nearly 30-year investigation and Mitchell knew just what to do with it. He sent it to an acquaintance, famed forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden, known for high-profile cases, including the O.J. Simpson trial. He looked at it and basically said, yeah, this is a homicide. So I did about a 9,000-word piece uh, on him called Gone. After he appeared, I got a phone call uh, from a guy named Wesley Turnage. Wesley Turnage, the childhood friend of the Vale family, and he had a story he'd been waiting to tell. I had car trouble, and I rode to work with him one day, and everything was okay, and I rode back with him the next day, and we just got to talking, you know, riding to work, just started talking. He said, uh, my wife wants another baby. She said, we had another baby, for, it'd uh, help our marriage. She said, I fixed that damn. She will never have another kid. And, and the way his facial expression changed and the way his voice changed when he started talking about her, it's like two different people just went from normal to evil just talking about her. And I told myself, you sitting here next to a cold-blooded killer. So why had it taken so long for Turnage to come forward? It bothered me, and I thought about that family down there a lot. But I didn't think that me telling them that was enough to get anything started on him. I promised myself that if it ever anything come up about that, 
I would call and let them know immediately what I knew. And Wesley Turnage wasn't the only person ready to talk. I called my son, cousin because she lives in Lake Charles and said they're going to show an interview. So I wanted to let you know. She said, oh, honey, we're having a rosary group come to the house tonight. We're going to pray for you. So she told the rosary group. One of the ladies in the rosary group was a caregiver to Sonny Apshar and went over to his home and told him. And Sonny says, well, I know them. I rented Felix his first room when he first came to Lake Charles. I considered Mary like my little sister. And I have a copy of the autopsy, the death certificate, and all the pictures. Not just any pictures. Pictures of the day Mary's body was removed from the Calcasieu River. And Sonny Ike Abshar, who drove the boat during the search, had held on to the photos long after police had discarded them from evidence. Their warehouse was overflowing with evidence from the past, and they cleared out our evidence to make room for the new evidence coming in. But that old evidence was about to spark a new investigation when it landed on the desk of Calcasieu Parish District Attorney John DeRogier. Will Harton showed up with an investigative reporter named Jerry Mitchell from the Clarion Ledger, and they told me this bizarre story about uh, murder and disappearing ladies, and it was just very intriguing. I happened to be walking by Mr. DeRosier's office to get a cup of coffee, and he said, uh, hey, Hugo, come here, I got a case I want you to look at. Intriguing, yes, but Assistant District Attorney Hugo Holland says he had to look at the case through the eyes of the court. So I had to filter everything through basically the, the code of evidence and take this, this body of stuff that I had and narrow it down to what I could actually use in a court of law. And so that was really the main concern that I had. So when the DA's office here um, got with Jerry Mitchell and, and kind of smelled some smoke, it was time to see if we could find the flames. And what they found was an inferno. I gathered up an investigator and went myself and visited with Mr. Abshar to get his story. Ike said, uh, boy, I've been waiting for you guys to show up for 50-something years. I got something I want you to see. And he went back to his bedroom, and he opened a safe, and he brought us uh, a manila envelope that had the word keep written on it. And when he opened it up, it had a copy of a supplemental police report from the sheriff's office from 1963. Uh, as well as the photographs of Mary's body coming out of the water. Mr. Abshire was uh, right there, the only survivor still alive at that point, who actually saw the body in the water and saw the body get taken out of the water and placed onto the stretcher. What interested me about it was um, his description of the position of the body when he saw it floating. It was almost laying straight on, it, uh, on its side not slouched over like a typical drowning victim. And I noticed in the basket when the body was loaded up onto the boat that it was laid out straight. And I asked him specifically what the condition of the body was when he first saw it in the water floating. And he said it was just like that, stretched out. And there's just something about that that troubled me. In 33 years of doing this, I've seen hundreds of drownings and People don't drown that way. Calcasieu Parish forensic pathologist Dr. Terry Welke would see the same autopsy report that had been provided to Dr. Bodden during Jerry Mitchell's investigation. Both Dr. Welke and Dr. Bodden would also review Ike Abshire's photographs. Of course, after uh, talking to the forensic pathologists, both of them, uh, they both concluded uh, uh, very quickly that the uh, person was dead before they entered the water. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, these were spinning a tale of murder. So she had been laying while she was stiff, face down in, on something dirty. The stains on her body uh, and, and the voids where there were no stains took on a, an entirely uh, a different significance as well. The scarf that was around Mary's uh, throat was three to four inches inside her mouth. I think the way he put it was, that wasn't no ladies knot. That's the way Ike put it. And you got this current coroner 
to say, to look at a 50-year-old black and white photograph that was taken of Mary's body when it was just fished out of the water. He looked at this photograph and he says that it had blown up and, and uh, doctored at a Photoshop or something, I don't know. So to, to, make, uh, uh, to go back 50 years and, and make a murder out of an accident, they had, to, they had to wipe out Dr. Avery Cook, who was a well-respected doctor who had done lots of floaters and when I talked to him after he did the, the, the autopsy on Mary, he said she, she was in better shape than 90-something percent of the floaters he had done. But it was actually a finding on that first autopsy that helped the forensic pathologist make their determination. If she had a large contusion, I want to say behind the left ear. Welke said, I don't know what killed her, but she was dead before she went in the water. Biden said, not only was she dead before she went in the water, but somebody strangled her to death. It, it seemed pretty clear to me that she gets banged on the head, she's knocked unconscious, then she's strangled, the body is left there for some period of time by Felix. When it turns dark, it's time to go get rid of the body. He takes the body out to the river and dumps it over the side. So there's the how, but what about the why? That's an easy motive. I'm taking out a big policy. I don't want to be married anymore anyway. I'm going to go ahead and murder her. It's also pretty easy to figure out why he murdered wife Annette Cravervale. That was money. The question is, why does he murder Sharon? Because Sharon's a hippie and she didn't have any money. According to Billy, did Felix say, hey, Billy, I killed your mother? Who's he talking to? He's talking to Sharon. Now convinced Felix was responsible for at least three deaths, investigators wanted to speak to him face to face. We were able to send some detectives uh, to Canyon Lake. We, were, we found where Mr. Vale was living. Uh, he was living in a basically a high fenced, kind of a small type compound. Uh, we were able to holler at him and try to get him to come out. He did come out, but he refused to talk to us, said it was, um, you know, that he was being set up and, and just all kinds of, of crazy talk about what he believed was going on uh, to him. He was a victim in a sense. Sometime in May of 2013, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, we were able to piece together enough. Uh, I think the district attorney presented it to a grand jury at that time and we were able to, to secure a arrest warrant. 51 years after Mary's death, Felix Bell was charged with murder and transported to Calcasieu Parish to await trial. I offered him a deal that would um, give him the opportunity to get out of jail before he died, although he would have to stay in jail quite a while, uh, and he declined. But the condition, of course, was that he had to tell me where the other two bodies were. No deal and no relief for the families. So once again, the case moved forward. It all of a sudden dawns on both of us. Oh, he's kind of old. He might not make it to the trial. But for his testimony about the photographs, uh, the photographs would not be admissible into evidence. And but for the photographs, we didn't have a murder case. So at 90 years old, Ike Abshire would take the stand for his testimony to be videotaped in case he didn't make it to trial. And I want to say within three or four months of him testifying, he had passed away before the trial. So, you know, but for that perpetuation, you wouldn't be sitting here talking to me and Felix would not be um, in jail. That would be just one of the obstacles prosecutors would overcome. Another would be having the disappearances of Sharon and Annette admitted into evidence. To do that, Holland would have to go all the way back to the 1800s. There was a guy in England that was prosecuted for uh, latching on to wealthy wives and they just happened to drown in a bathtub and he would get all their money and then he'd go on to another one. And so prosecutors in the brides in the bath case use the doctrine of chances and that basically is 
well, what are the chances that one guy marries a woman who drowns in a bathtub? And then he marries another woman who drowns in a bathtub. And then he marries another woman who drowns in a bathtub. Now, Felix is not stupid. So, so what problems did the accidental death of Mary cause him? So when he does this the next several times, at least that we know about, he makes sure we don't find the body. And Holland says an interview with another of Vail's former wives may have provided the gruesome details. Well, I mean, you know, I got to ask, like, well, why'd you leave him? She said, oh, he freaked me out one day. Really? Well, what'd he do to freak you out? She said, well, he was messing around in the trunk of his Carmen Ghia, but he was looking over his shoulder to make sure I wasn't watching him. Well, I was 18 at the time. What do you suppose the only thing I wanted to see right then was? So what's he doing in the trunk of that car? And so I snuck up behind him, and there was a secret compartment in the trunk, and it had a bunch of surgical saws in it. Bill says they weren't saws at all, just surgical tools called hemostats that he and his friends used to smoke marijuana. I don't have any doubt that they were saws. And I also don't have any doubt as to why we haven't found Sharon or Annette at this point. I mean, it really doesn't take a brain surgeon to put those things together. Holland says Felix's own words prove just how little regard he had for Mary. I read more than 20 years worth of journal entries from that guy, and the one love of his life was a woman named Beth. I don't remember Beth's last name, but he never, ever in the journals I read wrote about Mary, ever. But Felix's words were something jurors would never hear. I was not allowed to say one word in my defense, even at the end of the trial when I realized that all of these people were going to vote, vote me guilty. Regardless of what they had heard in the trial, they had heard this gone thing. And I'd say to my defense attorney, well, I might as well get on the stand and try to tell them the truth since nobody else knows the truth but me anyway. And they, their head almost hit the ceiling. They started, got, got in my face and started screaming, you can't do that. In one week, you will be writing you in Angola. And, and, and so I said, okay, 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 calm down, guys. And so I go back and I sit there and have them pronounce me guilty and, and watch the judge bite his lip to keep from grinning when he's saying life. So here I am, life. I don't know until the truth comes out. Yeah, here I am. Felix claiming even the judge was tainted by Jerry Mitchell's report. He had already gotten together with John DeRosier and said, give him to me. I'll put him in Angola for you. And he did. While Felix only stood trial in the death of Mary, the verdict considered a victory for all three families. Felix, meanwhile, maintains his innocence. Most people who's convicted say, I didn't do it, I'm innocent. Yeah, well, okay. You feel like you'll ever get another trial? I don't want another trial. I want them to drop the, the bogus charges that were made against me to start with. And if I had another trial anywhere in Louisiana, it'd probably be a repeat of the first one, which was just a uh, I don't know what to call it, like a, a high school drama club play or something. It, it was, it, I sat through the whole thing, watching it, trying to keep from shaking my head. It's like all these performers, one after the other, getting on a witness stand, trying to remember what they are supposed to say and, and stuttering and, well, I, uh, I don't remember exactly. I think there was something about a paddle uh, you know, I mean, obviously coached in trying to remember what they were supposed to say. Being paid for it with free uh, weekends in the, in the casinos and free round, free round trip airplane rides from California or Florida or wherever they were coming from. I mean, I don't know. All of them were paid and coached, I know. 30 something, probably I lost count and the whole trial, not one, 
in my defense, and I was not allowed to say one word in my defense. But investigators say although it took a lifetime, the truth has finally come to the surface. Is there anything else that you want to say to these families? To these, to families, no, not at all. Not a single word. I said everything that I thought that, that I could um, to, you know, to explain to them why their daughters wanted to get away from them. And um, apparently they didn't understand them. If you, if you were to live out your life here in Angola, would you die with a clear conscience? I have one and I've never had any other kind. I've lived my life trying to learn and, and uh, play, learn and play. That's my main objectives in life, and it still is. His only regret, Felix says, not being able to sit down for a conversation with Will. I sympathize with him still and would like to talk with him, but I don't know if that'll ever happen. I reached a point in my life where I said, there's not going to be any hatred. I'm not going to, I've just reached a point where I just have no feelings for Felix whatsoever. And I know Mary would have much preferred that than me to be burning with hate and, and ugliness and all that kind of stuff. So I, I just put it away. Reflecting instead on the undying love between a mother and son. My whole heart and soul wanted him to know how wonderful his mom was. You know, that was so important to me. As for Felix Vale, he remains behind bars at Angola State Penitentiary, where he's serving life in prison, sentenced to hard labor. Recently, the Louisiana State Supreme Court rejected Vale's attempt to overturn an appeals court ruling upholding his conviction and sentence.